Thank you for joining Breast Cancer Care WA for our webinar series on breast cancer, sexuality, menopause and women's health. Our first presentation today will be presented by Helena Green, a clinical sexologist and counsellor. Um, at the end of each presentation today, there will be a question and answer session. Um, you can ask your questions in the chat section on the right hand side of your screen um, and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Shall I leave that like that? Excellent. Um, welcome. Um, if you can't hear me, can you please just put a note in the chat room and they'll let me know um, if I need to speak louder for you. So um, thank you um, for being here today. And I'm not sure some people might know of me. Um, I work as a clinical sexologist, as Emily said, um, spoke about. And my background also is, is in nursing as well as counselling. And uh, I work as a sexual psychotherapist in private practice at Instinct for Life. So today I've been asked to talk about sexuality and after cancer and managing those symptoms and around relationship issues as well. So today I just, I just wanted us to have um, uh, acknowledging the diversity in um, how we express our sexuality and how we express our gender in our, in our lives. But for the simplicity for today, I would just like to acknowledge that I'll be referring to um, my client, I have a client kind of vignette that goes through the actual um, presentation and I'll be referring to them as um, she, them, her or cisgendered as uh, a female um, sexuality. But also to the presentation covers all aspects around um, sexual intimacy today. Having said that though, um, I've only got 40 minutes, I think, so it probably is only just the tip of the iceberg. So if you have any questions or any concerns, please feel free to contact Emily after the presentation. The sexuality and sexual wellness is really fundamental to the way we live our lives. I beg your pardon, that hasn't come up, I'm not sure why. Technical glitch. Hmm. Uh, is this a PDF? Yeah. That's why. So there's little things coming. That's okay. I need to read this slide too. There might be a couple of slides like this along the way. My apologies. So sexuality is fundamental to the way in which we share intimacy, how we experience physical closeness, how we um, dress, how we value our roles in society and in our relationships and family. And it's often also influenced um, not just um, in, in our relationships, but also from a social and cultural point of view as well. Very subjective. So, but also too really important to um, acknowledge that often when we grow up, we don't actually learn how to kind of negotiate um, sexual intimacy or talk about this. And particularly when there's a history of um, health issues, particularly like breast cancer, it can be pretty tricky a, a, as you go through treatment and um, wanting to return back to a sense of normality. So, I just want to include today, I was just thinking about how I was going to present and um, I'm hoping this works well. I, 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 this, the story I have included interwoven into um, my PowerPoint today or um, what I'm talking about is from a client that I worked with about five years ago and she was really happy to, she wrote, um, she wrote about her experience and this is part of it. So I'm hoping it will um, be relevant and resonate as well. So she spoke about when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, the furthest thing from my mind was about sex. I didn't even give it a thought to what losing my breasts would do to my sex life or how it would impact me in that area. My focus was on getting through the surgery and treatment. I was on survival mode. My husband and I did not discuss anything related to sex. It wasn't a priority. And I think, you know, what um, this client spoke to me about and what I hear quite regularly is that often um, the doctors that you see or specialists um, may not bring up the issue around sexuality or the impact of treatments on sex or intimacy and I think um, it's a real sadness because our sexuality remains with us throughout life no matter what age we are and often too there's a bit of ageism I think around um, Certain people, clinicians, might say because you're over 50 or you haven't brought up the issue around sexuality that you, it's probably not an issue for you. And I think um, 
if you're able to, there's, there's lots of resources available to talk about this. And even if your clinician or your specialist hasn't brought it up, take the risk to do that, just to check in with them. Because if they can't help you, there's other people that might be able to be supportive of you, particularly um, the breast care nurses and your GP and also the cancer council as well. Because we know that if your sexuality and your sexual relationship has been really positive, if it changes and becomes more negative, it can create um, more distress, more disconnection, and also sometimes um, conflict within the relationship. It also in, impacts on quality of life as well. When I, when I speak about sex um, and sexual activity, it doesn't necessarily just mean um, intercourse sex or having to be actively sexual. It's more about connection, how you feel about yourself, not just uh, physically, but also emotionally connected within your relationships or with yourself. So this is my client again, and, and she said that as soon as I recovered from my surgery, I was thrown into treatment. So she had chemotherapy and endocrine therapy. And this, she experienced major fatigue um, and really lots of emotional changes. Although we didn't discuss the impact of breast cancer on my sexuality, I knew it was very significant. So she, she knew that there was an issue there because of being together, the sex life and the intimacy was really positive. And this had kind of just flipped over on it on, and she didn't know what to do with it. And also they didn't have um, language to talk about this either. So with treatment, um, specifically in the area of breast cancer, there's lots of changes that occur. So things like um, changes to vag vaginal health that might impact on um, sex. So sex might become more uncomfortable, more, more painful. There's vaginal atrophy, depending on um, what stage of um, age you are in life and also about the medication that you're taking. It changes libido, so your energy to be sexual, um, changes arousal impacts on body image quite significantly and often then there's a hesitancy to engage in any sexual intimacy and also to difficulty to orgasm and just some stats just so you know that this is really common so at least 50 percent of individuals who um, undergo treatment will experience some level of distress around being able to be turned on being able to lubricate and also if you're not satisfied overall about the, the sexual intimacy, they often have um, regular discomfort or pain with sex. And I'll talk some more about that as we go along. And also pain, not just with sex, but just general pains um, also impact on your energy and availability to, to want to connect sexually. And also then a change in orgasmic function, which can be distressing for some people. So, and this is why I think it's really important if you've not had a conversation, but some of these issues are, are sort of happening for you or in your relationship, to see if you can talk to someone to see what, what we can do about that. Because there's always something that we can do to make it better. We may not be able to fix it totally, but definitely make it better and more comfortable, more pleasurable and satisfying as you um, have support in that area. There's a quality of life issue too, I think, um, Often when I work with um, couples and individuals, it's a sense of um, person, not just the treatment and having to manage that, but it's also returning to a sense of normality and connection and what gives you energy in life as well. So when you go through treatments and the type of treatments, whether it's chemotherapy, um, breast surgery, um, radiotherapy, it impacts on generally on your sexual wellness um, and that then in turn might impact on relationships. Um, also too, if you're on medication, there's lots of medications that actually impact on sexual functioning and also impact on desire and arousal and on orgasmic functioning. And, and they can be simple things like blood pressure tablets, antidepressants or hormonal blockers as well. If your partner has um, difficulty or their own issues that that might impact on how you're able to connect sexually. If there's a level of um, low mood and often it's not uncommon to feel low or even depression, that can sometimes get in the way of wanting to connect or work out what you can or want to do. 
pelvic pain, uh, again, and that can not necessarily be specific to sex or um, sexual intimacy, but general pains that impact on your, your wanting to connect and generally other health issues. So it's not just one thing that changes, there's quite a few things that can impact on reconnecting um, to yourself sexually or within the relationships that you are in. My client spoke about how she withdrew from any sexual advances and had no desire to experience intimacy. She also spoke about, which is, um, I, and I hear this quite often, the avoidance to that as well. She would create um, opportunities not to engage or to talk about this. And the sense of embarrassment then with the avoidance. Um, and she often went into the other room to get um, unchanged so that her partner wouldn't see her. And she spoke about that she didn't realize it at the time but she felt that she had nothing to offer. So quite, quite confusing and quite complex. And for lots of individuals, our, our breasts are, are a part of that intimacy and that feeling essential and feminine, and also around the pleasure of eroticism during sexual intimacy. So there's a lot that goes on through all this. And I think, um, it, uh, I think at the beginning, um, of, of treatment and, and diagnosis, absolutely, you have to get your head around that. But if sex or sexual intimacy is really important to you, um, even if you're not having sex, but that, that part of it, 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 it really needs to be um, checked in with, with one of your clinicians or, or someone like myself to see what you would like or how you would like to be supported. Unfortunately, there's no magic pill. Um, I know we talk about Viagra and I remember many years ago, um, there was, there's a doctor who's a sexologist and wrote a book called Good Loving Great Sex called Dr. Rosie King. And she thought she might experiment to see whether or not Viagra might sort of turn her on and get her in the mood. But all she experienced was, I think, some hot flushing and that's about it and a bit of a headache. So um, sex is about, not just about um, thinking, it's about feeling, it's also about having the capacity in your brain to be mindful to this. So if you're really busy, hectic, feeling fatigued, feeling worried, got lots of things happening, it's very hard to create a space or a place to think about this or to work out how you even can get there. Um, often, I think the hardest transition or the hardest um, or the most difficult part is understanding that Comparing to the past, because there's been changes for you, um, is not necessarily beneficial or helpful because it might stop you from looking at what might be possible or changing what's not working to something that is going to be positive and create satisfaction. And I think comparisons generally in life are, are not helpful because there's always going to be someone richer, um, lesser than us, or um, you know, uh, I think with social media as well, I think that creates some angst around this as well. And and, you, and also our thinking around this is really important. So our quality of thoughts about uh, ourselves is really, really important. When we talk about um, no magic pills, there's a, there's a there's, when it comes to sexuality, there, there is a, a point often, and you may experience this as well, we just can't be bothered or there's no desire because of treatment, whether it's surgical menopause or um, medical menopause or where you are uh, in life. I suppose it's more about not thinking about the outcome of I need to have sex or the pressure to that. It's more about being open to possibilities of connecting with your partner or with yourself and that self-care around that as well. So some practical point of views, and, and, I, and I spend a lot of time when I work with clients around the difference between um, the personal lubricants, vaginal moisturisers and vaginal estrogens. And I think um, when we think about ageing, uh, when we transition from perimenopause to menopause, there is a biological shift and there's a down, reg um, down regulation or production of estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, which is similar to when you're on hormone blockers. And that doesn't change. The level uh, becomes quite low. So therefore, you're going to experience physical changes like um, hot flushing, dryness, uh, vaginal dryness, vaginal thinning, and atrophy. So this slide is more about 
Um, personal lubricants are used during sexual activity, whether it's intercourse sex or using adult products. And uh, lubricants are really great to have. A good quality lubricant's even better. Things like uh, KY jelly or Vaseline or even oil is, is not the best because it can build up and it can create um, a barrier there. So it might change the pH in the vagina even further. But they're great for sexual intimacy. Vaginal moisturisers are a non-hormonal um, moisturising, as they say, for the vaginal mucosa and can be really beneficial even when you're not sexually intimate. So you use this quite regularly, uh, two to three times a week, and you use it at night time. The, the, main, the, the most common product is Replens, but there are probably newer products available like hyaluronic um, gel, which is really helpful, that, that are probably, it, it, it's personal preference, but they all do the same efficacy around moisturising the vagina so it's not so dry. To really work out with not the vagina moisturisers are working, you probably need to use them for about three months to, to give it a good go to see if there's any change for you as well. Vaginal estrogen is a hormone and it has um, estrogen in it and unless it's contraindicated and I think oncologists are generally more open to using this because it's a estrogen only used vaginally so it's very locally based but it it's actually can make all the difference because it kind of helps with the, the loss of vaginal um, uh, vag uh, vaginal estrogens that you have prior to having your treatment and prior to menopause. With the vaginal oestrogen, whether it's um, Ovestin or Vagifem, you need a prescription from your GP or doctor. The vaginal moisturisers or lubricants you can actually get online or go to a chemist and um, get that over the counter. If there's any more queries about that, please feel free to email Emily and she can forward that, forward that on to me and I'm happy to, to discuss that further. So the thing is too, Personal moisturisers or lubricants are great for vaginal dryness, but if you have more than that, like thinning or bleeding or uncomfortability where there's atrophy happening, then you need more intervention and you probably need to see a medical clinician just to check out what's happening as well. Okay, so still around the vulval vaginal area, often uh, with treatments, Sex becomes more painful. Um, there's a, a, a diagnostic um, label, I suppose, called genital genito pelvic pain penetrative disorder, and the medical terminology is, is about it's called dyspareunia, and that's basically pain with any sexual activity. So the pain might be before, during, and after. Pain pain is not usual. Um, and I think if there's pain where it creates an avoidance to be intimate, that needs to um, be assessed by someone that knows about pelvic pain. And also sometimes um, interventions to this. When I see someone I work with closely, I work with pelvic health physios. Um, when anyone has a history of pain or burning sensation or discomfort, um, in the past or with periods or with sex, I always um, make sure they see a pelvic health physio for an assessment because chances are, particularly when you've had treatments with, for breast cancer, there's going to be thinning, there's going to be not as much, um, I suppose, stretch, if you like to say, and also too, if you're not sexually active as you used to be, and, and, and with the client that I um, have alluded to today um, and not uncommon, sometimes it's, it's six months, months or a year or a couple of years or even longer since they've actually had penetrative type sex. So it's really important and, and I think from fundamental from a, um, a healthcare point of view and treatment is to, to, to seek support in that regard and there's some really great um, pelvic health physios out there who just work in this area. Because pain is, 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 is off-putting and, and sex is, or sexual intimacy is about, you know, um, satisfaction, pleasure, eroticism and, and connection. But if you're in pain, particularly when it comes to sex, it's, it, you're going to go, no, nah, I don't want this. What happens too, if there's a history of pain and you, and you kind of go, you know, I want to do this for my partner, for myself, and you tolerate that, over a period of time, there's a risk factor uh, in the area of, of 
where the muscles get quite tight around the pelvic floor and the entry into the vagina. And it can cause a condition called vaginismus where there's spasming of the muscle because it wants to protect you. We, we, we default to the negative and the body doesn't like pain. So if it's getting pain, it's going to kind of say, no, thank you. And then um, definitely having to see a physio and using um, vaginal dilators, which can be really helpful as well. And I think, um, and seeing someone like myself, a sex therapist, someone who works in the area of sexuality to talk about what you can do because often what happens when there's a long history of pain the brain interprets it really differently um, and there's a physical change to how you interpret the pain and then also the psychological impact around the the worry the avoidance the impact on the relationship potentially can be really helpful doing both just to just put it out there too um Pelvic pain is actually really common, both for male and female in the general population. So up to about 30% of women experience pain, uh, even without uh, a history of um, illness. And, and men about 23% do as well. And also changes in libido and arousal. So it, it's, you know, the ebb and flow of, of sexual intimacy across the lifespan um, can change. And sometimes we're not interested and sometimes we are. And I think to, um, when I talk about sexuality and sex, if it's not an issue for either of you or your partner, then it, then there's no concern. But if one partner is concerned, then it's worthwhile having a chat to someone um, because it impacts on your sense of self and your sexual self-esteem and your, your self-esteem and your body image um, in that regard. My client spoke about, because um, there was a disconnect, I hadn't had, um, intimacy for about six to 12 months. She felt rejected. Um, he explained that he wanted to avoid making any physical demand for fear of hurting. And, and, that, and I hear that regularly because often um, when you're in a relationship, you want to check it out and you want to try sex. And if, and if you're not knowing how to kind of put some strategies or practical stuff in place like lubricants or vaginal moisturizers or setting the mood up, um, you're going to try and check it out. And then as soon as it feels painful, um, both of you are going to have a sort of a downturn or shift in your libido and your partner doesn't want to do that. And so it's going to impact on them as well. It, it's interesting too, um, they, uh, she spoke about her own private pain and, and how they kind of had that, you know, um, walking in eggshells. And finally, when they spoke about it, it, it was a relief, but they feel still feel a bit, stu un, a bit stuck. And for, lots of individuals touch uh, is a connection and a feeling of loved valued and, and appreciated and they were struggling and they didn't really know what to do because during her treatment no one actually suggested them seeing anyone whether it's counseling or a sex therapist at this time and it, and again i want to stress that um the third of the clients that i see with with um a history of breast cancer and sexuality, you know, changes is it's anywhere between 60 to 80 percent. And in all of these cases, they all want support or to know what, what's available if they want to go ahead and implement some strategies or changes as well. So in regards to relationship, when when, the, when there's a change and a shift and a disconnect, it impacts not just on yourself, but with your partnership as well. And if there's any relationship issues around communication or conflict, it'd be really worthwhile before kind of talking about sex is to kind of see whether or not you can talk to that or see someone that might help support you in, in the relationship aspect. Because I think you need trust and a connection there before you can actually step into being sexual with your partner. Um, and that's really important. I think um, it's a ripple effect. So like uh, I, I said before, if you're feeling pain or if you're not into it, your partner doesn't want to Im impact on you any further. And that not being sexual intimate then impacts on their desire of thinking about sex similarly to yourself. It's quite complex, um, but also too, it's really important uh, if you can to talk about this if it's if it's part of your relationship that you want to renegotiate i think too often there's a miscommunication and as the clients have that i work with and this particular client said she felt unloved and a sense of rejection 
partners also experience that as well because it's kind of an avoidance and often too a hug is even avoided because in the past a hug meant it would lead to more and if you're not able to be there and it's too distressing or too uncomfortable you're just going to not do anything and there's kind of that avoid between the two of you also to part of talking about this without necessarily fixing it gives an opportunity to create safety and intimacy. Sometimes it's really hard because we don't have language to talk about this. We just assume that sex is always going to be okay. Um, but like anything in life, we discuss children, parenting, shopping, the washing, the finances. Um, it's unfortunate that sex is not part of that process, that we don't have comfortability around that. And that can be also related to how we grew up in our families and how we grew to know or learn about sex and sexual intimacy. Also, your past negative and po positive experiences around this as well. So this beautiful client said, I, I knew we needed counselling, but none of us felt the freedom to ask for help. Uh, none of them, so none of the clinicians offered advice or counselling um, this before or after surgery. Um, of course, my husband and I um, are partly to blame. Uh, we could have uh, probably and should have asked, but we didn't. This, this client also spoke about um, if she said if she was given information prior to her treatment, she might have just tweaked it a little bit or done something a little bit different to what she did, what she chose to do. So there's a bit of decision regret for her. So um, this is just a general overview why, why you might consider counselling. And I think um, it, from my perspective, the counselling should provide a safe space for you to think about and talk about what, what's important to you around your sexuality and, and well-being and what kind of gets in the way. And then to consider what you might like to do or what's possible in the context of your um, circumstances. If there's relationship distress, miscommunication, uh, sexual um, difficulty with sexual communication, it's worthwhile um, checking in to see if there's someone that you feel safe enough to talk with about this and to consider what you might like to do about it. Often I get um, individuals come in first because their partner's a bit hesitant or they're not weren't sure. So even if you saw someone initially on your own, just to have a chat to see what that feels like for you and then um, you've got the information to take back to your partner if you are in a relationship, which will be really good. If you're not in a relationship and um, talking about sex and sexual intimacy and changes can be really, uh, I think, anxiety provoking hugely. And even in that regard, I think it'd be worthwhile chatting with someone um, to give you a process to think about what you might like but also take the pressure off because I think um, often when I work with individuals who are on their own, there's a sense of um, I need to let this potential partner know because if I don't, then they think I'm, I'm deceiving or not giving them the truth. And I actually think like any, when you meet someone, it takes time to get to know them, to trust that process. And I think, I think it's really important that there's no pressure or rushing to let the other person know about your personal circumstances because they are personal to you. But when you're feeling um, that it's the right time, then you talk about some of that. You don't have to disclose everything. Um, but talking with someone to work out some strategies might be really helpful in that regard. Just little things to hence um, sexual intimacy. So if, if generally if things are, are going well and you're wanting to sit, check out to see how you do go, Create the environment, so things like candles, the mood, um, your energy, make sure you're not in pain, um, make sure that your partner and you're not in conflict, make sure if you have children, they're, they're not there. So you can kind of just tune into just kind of um, what you would like. Um, Self-nurturing and self-pleasure and time for intimacy is really important. And again, take the pressure off intercourse type sex, just it's about connection, it's about time together to, um, but also even when you're feeling still not kind of okay, creating safety around that and that might be still wearing um, some lingerie or some clothes that you feel, you know, good in, um, even though you still might connect physically. Um, 
and also too before I always recommend before you you kind of reintroduce the sex the first time after treatment prelude is to agree not to have intercourse sex it is to talk about what you want and about connecting so it should be playful fun um it doesn't have to be fun but it could be just connecting and just being there without pressure to think that your partner wants you to take it further more than what you're ready for but also to connect so things like touch skin to skin touch um, massage is really good if that's what you like because our body produces those beautiful chemicals like dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin that are connecting as our kisses you know if you kiss um and a six second kiss apparently according to gottman i'm a couple therapist with gottman therapy produces um, endorphins and a bonding chemical. So hugs, spooning, th that's all really good. So as humans, we need connection. I, I think it's fundamental for our well-being. I think, in that regard. If possible, not compare past sexual experiences, intimacy with what's happening currently, because it might just um, hold you back from maybe seeing what, what is possible or experiencing something new and different, or it might kind of because it's not as good or wasn't as pleasurable you might avoid it totally it's really important to think about um sex changes over our lifespan so sex in our 20s 30s and 40s is very different to our 50s and 60s and on older and particularly when you have a, um, a health issue so it, it's to see what is realistically hopeful and possible that you might want to kind of consider for yourselves So things like keeping um, fit, uh, practice, uh, mindfulness, I'm not sure, I think mindfulness is, is quite a common term, mindfulness meditation, mindfulness sex. And basically that all that is, is if your brain's really busy, it's anxious, stressed, got to think about the kids, got to think about work, got to think about the washing, I'm cranky with my partner. There's no way, because there's so much thing, so many things happening, there's no way that you're going to have the capacity to think about sex or what you want sexually, as I said before. And it's really important to tune into ourselves because sometimes with the stress and distress, you want to kind of do the right thing for others and you forget about yourself and forget about what's important for you. So think about how you might do that. There's some really good apps around. And again, it's about being intentional. It's about making time for you initially. And then if you're in a relationship with your partner, but also that self-care and mindfulness for self is really, really, really important. Because it then gives you capacity to think about what you want or what you might like or what you don't like. Pain management is really important um, to be mindful to that, to make sure you have, and also the energy, because um, treatments like the, the radiotherapy and chemotherapy can really impact on energy. And your, and your sexiness or your femininity or masculinity. So just think about what you can do to keep pain under control. Remember that sex is not just about intercourse. And if there's an issue around that, to talk to someone. And always remember good lube as well. And also candles, smells. So we use the five senses. So um, just be creative, I think. An opportunity to be, to be creative in that regard. I spoke about mindfulness. Um, believe it or not, our brain is the probably best sex organ that we can have. And when you get rid of all the uh, reduce, if you can, or um, the actual stress and business in life, the way we think about sex, the way we um, our self talk around it can be really helpful, particularly when the, there's low libido, low libido, or no desire for sex. So often. Um, we know that even if you're, if we're not feeling like we want sex, but your partner would like to connect with you, if you're feeling well, if you're feeling no pain, no stress, well, no, no such thing as no stress, I suppose, but being open to the possibilities, because often, um, particularly for lots of people um, and for those going through menopause, there's actually no, because the, the, there's a uh, decrease in hormones like uh, testosterone and estrogen and, and progesterone that kind of um, reminder to be sexual is, is not as strong so thinking about what you want thinking about eroticism thinking about your partner how you like to be touched how you the, the the felt experience of that 
can then create the neurobiochemicals you need for arousal and help with desire. So it's kind of like a feedback loop. So if you're in your head and you're thinking about the washing or come on, hurry up, this is taking too long, you kind of switch off those chemicals because you're getting to stress chemicals and it reduces dopamine, reduces oxytocin, reduces um, the, the feel-good hormones like do, um, that kind of keep you in tuned. So how we think about it, creating time for it is going to be really important because it's the chemicals from our brain that get converted through into our spinal cord, into our pelvic area for engorgement, for being open to receive the penis, so to speak, or uh, whatever you're using for penetrative sex. So it's more comfortable and it helps you lubricate. It takes longer sometimes because you're not having um, as much of that kind of biological drive. So taking your time, enjoying the process before penetration can be really, really helpful and useful. If you're struggling with that, please, please feel free to talk to someone. In my experience, and I've been doing this for 10, oh, probably a lot of years, but specifically in counselling 10 plus years, that um, there's always something that can be done. And between um, up to 70% of, of clients who kind of check in or kind of want to have this information, do want to speak about this, we, we can make a difference. It may not necessarily fix things, may not be able to take you back to how it was 10 years ago, but can definitely make it better uh, in, in lots of ways as well. So things like um, often when there's conflict, particularly around sexual intimacy, we sometimes we blame the other or blame the situation. So um, really important to create um, rituals of connection around uh, love and appreciation to create opportunities to be intimate. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to be sexual. Taking time out as a couple, um, date nights. I think sometimes when you're in a longer term relationship, we forget about the beginning times. We, we kind of fall into a habit of getting things done and work and not really self-caring for us or the relationship. So a date night, I know it's, it's a little bit um, complicated with COVID, but even at home, even if, they, if, if you have children or other people in the house to see whether or not they can be outsourced, so to speak, so someone can care for them, where you can have time for your own selves just to be without logistics, without um, social media or um, iPhones or any IT happening. Because that's really important to talk. And then you start talking about what you might like to um, create or um, how you want to go forward together as a couple or even individually, time for self is really important. Consider counselling and consider it with someone that has a, um, a knowledge in the area of sexuality um, and, and around health, but definitely around sexuality as well. I think too, when you take time to talk about stuff and create a space that is non-blaming, it's, it's amazing what you can learn about yourself, but also you, um, the other person that you're with. And then hopefully, uh, I just took a letter, uh, I took a leaflet out of my mailbox informing me that I can have sex at 82. I'm so happy because I live at 73, so it's not too far to walk home afterwards. And it's really important because we are living longer and um, people, 30%, 30 to 40% of people over the age of 60, I think it is, are still um, regularly sexually intimate. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Helena, that, for that wonderful presentation and your expertise. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions. Is that one there? Uh, what brands of lubricant and vaginal moisturisers do you mostly recommend? Okay, so um, lubricants uh, pure, P-J-U-R, is what I would recommend. Um, Online or they're only available from adult shops. So oh, some people. Have them too. Oh, do you? Have, oh, yeah. yeah, that's right. Cancer so we do. Yeah, we actually have them here yeah. at the Breast Cancer KWA office. So we can. You can either come in, um, or we can post it out to you Perfect. as well. That's, that's right. Okay. So if you do that, otherwise you can always check out the sex adult shops. So that could be fun. Um, moisturizers. It, you know, replenish is okay, but that's quite expensive. So um, there's another one, but I. It's it's called Vagisil Pro Hydrate, but I will email you you can send it out and have it available on, online um 
the other thing too, often when I work with uh, individuals and they actually go to see a physio, uh, the physio's honey and bee or olive and bee is something that they suggest as well. Bee. Yeah. So again, it depends on your circumstances. That that may not be enough. So the the you might need something a bit more lubricating. The the pure brand has uh, either silicon based or water based, and it's therapeutically made. So chances are there's less allergies and less um, changes to the pH vaginally. Thank you very much. That's fabulous. Can you tell us a little bit about your role and work? Yeah, okay. So um, background many, many years was for uh, as a nurse and also breast cancer nursing and general cancer nurse coordinator. And then because the, the issue of sex after cancer was was really, really common and I, and I felt inept and not able to um, talk to that as a nurse. So about, oh my God, it's 10 years ago now plus, <laughs> that I went back and did studies um, in sexology and also counselling. And I worked then during that time at the Menopause After Cancer Clinic at King Edward. So I've transitioned and worked solely now in private practice. And I work as a sex therapist and a couples therapist um, with a really uh, interest in pelvic pain and uh, cancer related um, sexuality as well. So if I'm part of the Cancer Council network, so often I get referrals via the network as well. Right. Yeah. And do people need a GP referral to see you? No. Or? So um, to the Cancer Council though, if you, because they actually um, pay me at my private practice at Instinct for Life. So you get, it used to be six sessions, you get four sessions that are covered by Cancer Council, they pay me. Um, and then you have to though individually ring up, so no referrals. So you have to self refer and sp and ring up the nurses helpline thirteen eleven twenty, and they they know me really well. So and and that's my area of expertise. Um, GP referrals not. Um, it's only helpful for information. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a counsellor. I don't have we don't have access to Medicare rebates, but I I have um, private health certain private health okay. rebates. Um, if, if there's an issue around that, but self referral is fine. Mm -hmm. I get lots of those, or um, the people, the doctors I used to work with, they, they were refer as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, you've answered a lot of these questions anyway. Um, what what take home advice would you have for women? Okay, take home advice. Um, take the pressure off. Um, consider what would be helpful or useful to you. Um, talk to someone. Talk to someone, talk to one of the breast nurses or um, the Cancer Council helpline. Uh, get some information to see if that that's, is helpful to you. Um, feel okay to even talk to your clinicians. I think um, we need to be brave as consumers to um, ask for what we want and need. And if they're not able to provide that with you, um, because I think half the most of the time the clinicians are really anxious because they don't feel like they've got the actual solution to this and they don't have to have the solution they just need to know where to refer you to and if worse comes to worse bring the cancer council or breast cancer wa around this as well but also to um i think self-care i yeah, think self-care is the absolutely. most important thing around this yeah. and are there any resources people can access online that you could recommend yes um cancer council have a wellness um, online resource there's also the the cancer australia uh also, Jean Howes Foundation, I don't know if people know about Jean Howes, mm -hmm. and the Australian Menopause Association have evidence-based information about um, menopause, um, breast cancer, hormone therapy. So they're really good. Um, and a couple of good books around too. I think, um, and I can't think of, of her surname, Kate, um, and, 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 to okay. you, on, on uh, um, cancer and if, if you really want something specific to cancer is female sexuality and cancer it's quite good um, but I think uh, the cancer council one's really good and and again just make sure they're evidence-based that's what I really recommend and one more question someone's asked if we could if we have the data source early in the presentation you mentioned a statistic with at least 50 percent yes okay the data source that I was involved with some research with um, a few clinicians, and I don't know if I've written down here. I can, yeah, I can send if it's also, important. Yeah, we'll an article, yeah, we'll do that. Um, it was done with Paige and Paige Tucker and, and a few other clinicians. All right. Other questions that we can see? Oh. 
Thank you so very much for joining us today. We are so thankful for you coming in and sharing your expertise with us. Um, we know that these presentations are really going to benefit clients and patients going forward. So thank you so much. We'll take a short break uh, and be back at 2pm with our next presentation, Dr. Leslie Ramage. So you can exit this screen now if you like and go back to the home screen ready to start the next presentation soon. Thank, thank you. you. You were.